Ecclesiastes 2. I left off in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I want to pick it up in verse 12 and go to the end of the chapter, Lord willing. (laughs) I wanted just to have a little introduction here with you, though, first about this. I was reminded when I was reading this that the Declaration of Independence states that we have uh, certain rights that were given by our Creator, God. And they are life, liberty, and what's the third one? Pursuit of happiness. You've heard this before. Good. Well, that goal is one of the things that's made the United States great. It's obviously not perfect. (laughs) We have our challenges, but there's great things about it too. It's a place where people are free to pursue a happy life. (laughs) And even though I appreciate that fact a lot (laughs) living here, it's important to know that the pursuit of happiness does not guarantee (laughs) happiness. Actually, happiness is a very elusive thing. And that's what we're going to talk about here today in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. It's sort of like this picture that I want to show you of this horse. It's kind of like that. This horse with the girl is chasing this carrot that's just out of reach. And it doesn't look like he's ever going to get it like that. And I want you to kind of keep that in mind because this is essentially what Solomon is describing in Ecclesiastes. And in the end, if that is our approach, the the pursuit after the things that we hope will make us happy, it will actually leave us bitter. And we're going to see that that's what's happening to him here in our text. So I called this message the that elusive pursuit of happiness, because it is. It's elusive if you go about it the wrong way. Jesus told us how to do it the right way. And it's very simple. He said this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. He was trying to get the disciples and now us to remember to keep God first all the time. It's a simple thing. It's not easy all the time, but it's simple that God should be first. And that's the solution here too. We want to make sure that we seek God first. So I'm going to talk about that as we go through these verses. But Solomon is going to actually despair here over five things. I think it's inadvertent. It's not inadvertent by God, but it's inadvertent by him. (laughs) He's going to convince us to not put our faith in the world to make us happy (laughs) like he was trying to do. And so we're going to be wise about this and make sure that God is first. And then we won't despair like him. So let's start here. And the first thing he despairs over in our outline this morning is what if nothing matters? So number one, if you're taking notes, what if nothing matters? That's what he's going to get into here in the first few verses. And he said this in verse 12. Then I turned myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who succeeds the king? Only what he has already done. Solomon has been telling us how he tried everything life has to offer to find fulfillment apart from God. He had great wealth and possessions. He had the the best that money could buy. We found out last time, previous in chapter 2, that he had countless servants and, and a life of pleasure and luxury like no one has ever had. He said, if you go back to verse 10, he said, "Um, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. So you get an idea of what kind of a life he had. He had everything that should make a person happy. But whatever he does, the outcome is always the same. It's back in verse 11. (laughs) He said, all is vanity and grasping for the wind and there's no profit under the sun. He says these phrases repeatedly in Ecclesiastes to let us know that even though he thought those things would satisfy him, they never did. Oh, it was probably fun for a while, but ultimately it leaves him empty and frustrated. So he asked that question there in verse 12, what can anyone do more than I can do or I can have? Well, the answer is You can't. (laughs) He had it all. He could do it all. So now what he's going to do is turn to wonder if it's any better 
to be wise than a fool then here in life. He says in verse 13, then I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I myself perceive that the same event happens to them all. Solomon also wrote the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs contrasts wisdom and foolishness. And basically the message of Proverbs is it's better to be wise than foolish, you know. And here's what you do to be wise kind of a thing. And that's the same thing he's saying here. He compares it light and dark. It's being wise is better than foolish, like light is better than dark, right? And we know that. But he's disturbed here. And you can tell by reading it. He's essentially asking, like, this point that I'm going through here in our first part is, what if it doesn't really matter whether you're wise or foolish? And he tells us why he's thinking that now, because he said the same event happens to them all. So what's the same event that he's talking about here? Dying, right? Death. He says it doesn't pay to be a fool here on earth, but he says we end up the same anyway. Death is the great equalizer. He says even if you live wisely, you die just like a fool does. And you know, in a sense, he's right. <laughs> because when our time is up, it's up, isn't it? Now, you know what's, what's great is our modern era has actually improved our average life expectancy. Do you know that in the last 200 years, our life expectancy is doubled what it was 200 years ago? So that's good, right? We still die, right? That hasn't changed. And you know, they say that women live longer than men on average too. And do you know why that is? Well, I have some pictures here to show you why women live longer than men on average. So there's one. (laughs) Have any of you guys done this? (laughs) What's the next one? Next one. (laughs) There is so many things wrong with this picture. You know, he's got a fire. He's like, and then one more. Yeah. (laughs) This is one of those Darwin awards just about ready to happen here. These are some reasons why women live longer than men. But eventually Solomon is right. The same event happens to us all. So it's It's really bothering him. So it says in verse 15, I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, this also is vanity. For there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever. Since since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? As the fool. So again, he's bummed out clearly here because not long after the funeral, the wise person isn't really remembered more than the foolish one. He's like, they're just going to forget about me. So what's the use? Does any of this really matter? Why have I spent so much energy trying to be wise all my life? Now remember, he's uh, approaching everything from man's point of view. I mean, I think we talked about that the first week in Ecclesiastes, that You could say that the rest of the Bible is written from God's point of view, mostly. But Ecclesiastes is different in that it's written from man's point of view, a man trying to live apart from God, right? And if you do that, these are the kind of conclusions that you come to. What, What does it even matter? Well, the next verse, 17, shows where that leads. He said, therefore... I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me for all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Okay, next stop in our elusive pursuit of happiness, number two, is what if I hate life? What if I hate life? He says, it's not fair. I put all this energy into my life and then poof, it's gone. Why bother? What's the point of it all? You guys, I think this is where people get to who end up taking their life. It's just too painful to go on. But I'm here to tell you, it doesn't have to be that way. There's a solution to all this, if you really want it. I mean, I struggled with a lot of stuff as a young man and tried to medicate myself because I didn't know what to do and it was getting worse and worse and worse. And so I can understand the pain that people feel. But there is a solution and I found it and God wants all people 
to find the solution. I'm leading our young adults group and with my wife, and we kind of were talking about some of this stuff on a Friday night when we met. And you know what? It, we just kind of came to the conclusion that it's so good to talk about the difficulties because so many, especially young people, get discouraged when they don't achieve what they want to. You know, when you're a young person, you're like idealistic, at least most are, I think, about, you know, what life is going to be like and what I'm going to have and how it should go and, and all those things. But what happens when they don't get what they want? And then do they turn to be like Solomon? Or, or what if they do? To me, this might even be worse. What if you do get what you're after and it's still not fulfilling enough for you? Because that's what's happening to him. It can be distressing to a person. It's distressing to him. And maybe you're here today and you're distressed about this. And you're like, life is not what it ought to be. Well, here's the problem. Let me just diagnose it for you. Most people in the world put their hope in happiness. Most people in the world put their hope in happiness. The things that we look forward to, having a baby, a promotion in, in my career, our wedding, whatever it is. But those things, those events, they never quite fulfill. It's, it's sort of elusive. And so what happens? It's on to the next thing and the next thing. Well, maybe that will be. So then you're like that horse chasing the carrot. But you never quite, it's out there. My happiness is out there, but I never quite catch it. Solomon says, look, I got to the top of everything and I couldn't find it. So you know what he did? He hated life, hated it. He had all this ambition and he, he achieved a lot, but it led to a dead end. I was reminded by somebody in our church and then I went and looked up the quote. There's a, a famous actor, comedian actor, uh, Jim Carrey, and he's, you know, very wealthy. And he was quoted as saying this and it fits into what we're talking about here. Listen to what he said. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Wow. Solomon sure did, didn't he? But he said there in verse 17, it was distressing to him. Verse 18, he says, then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Okay. So not only did he hate life, began to hate what he did too. I wrote in my, my notes, he's frustrated to the max. He is. Now, you know, when I was reading, you know, I was thinking about hating life and hating what you do. I, I was thinking about how lots of people say, I hate myself, but I don't believe that anybody really hates themselves. And I know that because the Bible says we don't. Ephesians 5 says nobody ever hated their own flesh. But the Apostle Paul says there, he says, we actually cherish ourselves. And we do. I mean, I can prove it by, by just pointing out this illustration. That's why when somebody takes a group picture with you in it, and shows it to you, who do you look at first? Come on, you can say it. <laughs> and then, here's what we do. This is the worst. <laughs> we judge the quality of the photo based on how we look in it, don't we? Everybody else could look fabulous, but if we're like, oh, that's a terrible picture because I look bad at it, you know? No, it's not. You just don't look that great. <laughs> we love ourselves. But Solomon is on to something here, isn't he? Because the people who say they hate themselves, you know what they actually hate? Life. Just like him. And here's why. I want to keep kind of like coming back to this main thing. It's because they've placed all their trust and hope in it. And it doesn't ever measure up. It can't. You see, the natural man, the man or the woman of the world, Solomon says, under the sun, right? the man and the woman of the world, we actually believe in secular things by faith. It becomes like a religion for us when we're a man or a woman of the world. We can start to believe in a peaceful environment by faith. You know, if I just, if I just, you know, the forest is my God kind of a thing. Or I can believe in, in medicating myself with drugs. That becomes sort of my, I believe in that by faith. It'll make me happy kind of a thing. Or obtaining great amounts of knowledge, right? These things 
people do to they it's it's to put their hope in happiness to try to achieve happiness but the scriptures continually turn us back to Jesus and not other things because you are going to believe in something by faith everybody does i know a guy who believes in his wife by faith to make him happy and it's not going so good if it's not a relationship with god you will likely get where solomon is and so that's the warning here he said there in verse 18 if we can go back to that one more time he said he hated it because he goes i'm just gonna die anyway and i'm gonna leave it to someone else well now we've come to our third (laughs) uh, stop on that elusive pursuit of happiness this one is what if i have a knucklehead son because he does. What, and he, he's worried about it. What if I have a knucklehead son? I've invested all this time and money. I've built this fortune. I have it all the way I wanted. And now I'm going to leave it behind to him. Look at what it says next, verse 19. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor which I have toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. Again, he's put his, his, all of his effort into building his empire, and then he's going to leave it behind to the knucklehead son who wastes it all, and he doesn't appreciate it. There was a study done by a company called the Williams Group, and they found out that when parents leave a large sum of money to their children, they found that 60% of the time that those children squandered all the money. In 90% of the cases... It's gone by the time the grandchildren die. Wow. 90% of the time, a large sum of money, it's gone by the time the grandchildren die. I was looking at a few examples of this. Um, and the, the guy who started Woolworth's uh, department stores, if you remember those, his daughter inherited $50 million dollars from her father. And when she died a few decades later, she was bankrupt. And so these things do happen, like $50 million. Well, why is that? Well, because they're foolish. They don't appreciate how they got it and those kind of things. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, became king right after him. He inherited everything that his dad had, and he was a knucklehead. First Kings 14 tells us that the first thing that he did was to get counsel from others on how to lead Israel. So that's good so far. And he was urged by the elders who were with Solomon, his dad, to serve the people, to be good to them. And he listened. And then he went and talked to his friends that he grew up with. And his friends go, no, 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 no. don't listen to those old guys. Just be harsh with everybody. Treat them roughly. You'll get more. You'll build an empire like you've never seen before. And so who do you think he listened to? His friends. (laughs) And we know him in the Bible as a bad king. It says he did evil in the sight of God. And do you know what he did that was prophetic about what we're reading here? He lost the treasures of the temple and the king's palace to the Egyptians. Squandered it. Solomon thought all this this effort it was dumb if the next one to come along is not going to appreciate it or waste it all. And he was right. Now, before I go on, just let me say, I don't think that leaving money to our children is necessarily a bad thing. But... We ought to leave them a spiritual heritage above all else, shouldn't we? I mean, you parents that know the Lord, we should show them that Jesus is good. We should urge them to walk with him and to find their fulfillment in him and teach them to serve him, to be an example, live an example before them, right? Spiritual heritage is much more important. Well, number four along our stops of the elusive pursuit of happiness is what if it's too much to take? What if it's just too much to take? He says in verse 20, therefore, I turned my heart and despaired of all the labor in which I had toiled under the sun. I believe in verse 20 here, the despair is the key word. And I was just wondering about our community, the Treasure Valley here, people in the our neighborhoods, how many of them are despairing right now because of their pursuit of things other than pursuing God? You know, I, my heart breaks for the senior citizens in Idaho who've just chased after the American dream and thought that that was their God and, 
and omitted God from their life, and now it's again to the end of their life, and it's a sad thing. And again, we're talking about those that are under the sun, the, the point of view of the person who's living apart from God. There's a, uh, a really good movie on YouTube that illustrates this. It's the Joey Baran story. If you get a chance, it's just an hour and it's called Beyond the Dream. He's sort of like, his, he's kind of like a Solomon. As a young man was the best surfer in the world. I think he was achieved the, the pinnacle of the sport at something like 18 years old. He was a rock star in the surfing world. Everybody wanted to be Joey's friend. They loved him. They were throwing money at him. He had all the sponsorships and, you know, he was like Mr. Popular and all that kind of stuff. And then he ended up winning the Hawaiian Pipeline Masters, which is at the time was like the Super Bowl of surfing, but it wasn't enough. I mean, the thrill was gone as soon as he got it. I think God let him have that so that he could see it wasn't enough because it never is. He talks about a spiral of despair that began in his life until he met Jesus Christ. I mean, he tried to take his life. And you know what? The Lord came into his life and gave him a future and a hope, saved him from his sins and gave him joy and peace. And, And today he's a Calvary Chapel pastor in Southern California. And I've met him and You know, he sent us, um, I asked him for those DVDs because, uh, but boxes of them, you know, got some over the years and handed them out to teenagers in outreaches and stuff because it's such a great story. They're all gone now (laughs) because we gave them all away, but you can always point someone to that link because it's a great story. And if you haven't had a chance, you might want to check that out, but it's just a testimony of God's grace, even in the midst of hopelessness. Verse 21 says, for there was a a, a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. Yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. For what is man for all his labor and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? For all his days sorrowful and his work burdensome. Even in the night, his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. Boy, it's a sad testimony that he's describing, isn't it? He has all these marvelous things and, and he's given his all to acquire them, but it still leaves him empty and unfulfilled. Uh, in verse 23, he said, now it causes that number one, his days are sad. Number two, his work is a bummer. And number three, he can't sleep at night. You see, it's all leaving this, this bitter aftertaste in him. It's just, it's like too much for him to take. And obviously he's approaching things as a non-believer. He's trying to replace God with life. But I just want to talk to you also if you're a Christian today, because it can begin to look something like this if you're a Christian who starts to live after the flesh, because you can start to think that the, the things of life is what really makes you happy. It's not God. Paul wrote to the Galatians about this subject. And in chapter three of Galatians, he, he said, you began in the spirit... And now you're trying to make yourself perfect in the flesh. In other words, you guys came to know God by faith and you were saved. And that's great. You're in Christ. (laughs) But now you're trying to live a life in the flesh like everybody else does. And you wonder why you're frustrated. (laughs) We weren't made to live like that. That chapter, Galatians chapter 3, urges everybody to go back and just live by faith. Just simply put God first. Live by faith. Put on the mind of Christ. Trust him. It's, a, it's really sort of simple, but we have to be reminded of these. I need to be reminded of these things because we can start to put our hope in happiness or hope in the world, and it's just not there. Well, there's one more thing here in that elusive pursuit of happiness, and, and that is what if I just make the best of it? So number five is what if I just make the best of it? And he said, verse 24, nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment more than I? He says, well, maybe just enjoy it all as a blessing from God then, you know, kind of make the best of it. Again, these are his like under the sun rules. <laughs> You've probably heard someone say it who doesn't know the Lord. They're like, just find pleasure in the simple things of life. <laughs> and I can appreciate that sentiment because that person 
will try to make the best of things without God. They'll, you've probably known some, they, they work hard. They try to be nice. <laughs> they try not to get caught doing anything wrong. <laughs> they try not to hurt anybody. And, and, and that's good. But the unfortunate part about this is it leaves out eternity. And that is the biggest mistake of all. He said there, who can enjoy life under the sun more than me? Except he doesn't. You know, I was thinking reading this, that listening to Solomon give advice about contentment is like taking dating advice from somebody who has a lot of bad relationships. (laughs) You're just like, I'm not going to listen to you. Now, what actually will work and it's proven to work is living a spiritual life, putting God first in my life, to live with God in um, above the material things. Not that material things aren't important or that, you know, you can't have them, but that that would be our desire. And do you know what? Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians 10 that then if that's what we do, he said, then whatever you eat or drink and whatever you do, you do to the glory of God. See, things are in their proper perspective then. They're in their proper order. You see, then you can really enjoy the simple pleasures of life because they're not trying to take the place of God's joy. So then when you have that anniversary or you have that boyfriend or girlfriend or the job, they don't have to fulfill you. God fulfills you. And to me, that's the best way to live. And that's my takeaway from this. Well, let's finish here in verse 26. He said, for God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and collecting. Then he may give to him who is good before God. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. In other words, God gives joy or true happiness to the one who walks with him. To the person of faith, those things are not elusive. (laughs) We possess them right now. It's great. Isn't it? But to the one who rejects God, even though he does the same kind of work, he doesn't get the same pleasure out of it. Wow. You see, life apart from Christ is empty and unfulfilling, whether we want to admit it or not. It just is. But life in the Son of God is rich, fulfilling, and satisfying. Now, some of you might be trying to live a life under the sun, like Solomon. You're trying to live a life based on faith in accomplishments, for example. You want to make something out of yourself. You want to be happy doing things. Well, but in the end, even if you accomplish all that, it's still going to be empty because that's why this is here in the Bible. In other words, you can have an abundant life, but not if you try to get it by pursuing happiness. It's elusive, like the horse and the carrot. The Bible, Jesus. Jesus said, he who has the son has life. (laughs) Do you have the son? Pray that you do. If you really want a happy life, guys, embrace Jesus. Ask him to come into your life if if you haven't done that yet. Ask him to make you new. He will. He'll put things in the proper perspective and you'll be blessed. And then you'll experience what life really is. And I want to close with questions for the car ride home. I've been putting these at the end of messages lately so you can have some discussion time in the car just to kind of help you. If you're by yourself, you can just think about them. (laughs) Or if you're with somebody, you can kind of bounce them off each other. So here's the question. And by the way, they're in the app if you if you miss this or don't want to write them down. The first one is, is your life satisfying? Why or why not? Is your life satisfying? Why or why not? Number two Do you despair of life or do you have the joy of the Lord? Do you despair of life or do you have the joy of the Lord? And then the last question for the car ride home is this. Am I putting my trust in God or something else? Putting my trust in God or something else? Pray you are putting your trust in God. (laughs) I know that's my desire. If you're in Christ, it's a simple thing to do. (laughs) 